Uh, very good morning. Uh, firstly, I uh, want to thanks to a really good friend of mine, my dear friend, Dr. Nur Shamsina, who is willing to uh, share her perspective and share her view and share her knowledge today with us. Yeah, we are very fortunate to have to have you here. Yeah, uh, to uh, actually you are the first ever, uh, ever speaker uh, at our very brand new uh, webinar. So we're going to have a, a monthly webinar that uh, will be uh, held uh, uh, on a second week of, of the month. Yeah? So you are actually the first uh, speaker of our very brand new webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuro, for, uh, for joining us today. Okay, uh, before we're uh, moving to the, uh, the main uh, agenda today, which is the talk by Dr. Nuro, I would like to ask, uh, uh, the one and only yeah, Prof Ratu to uh, uh, give uh, opening remark yeah, for uh, for uh, uh, op appreciating the the webinar today. Prof Ratu, are you on on air now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Silakan Prof Ratu ya. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fedi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and good morning to everyone who is joining us today through Zoom. Yeah. Thank you to the audience who have taken the time to attend the graduate lecture series at Magister Biology Impact, which will be delivered by Dr. Nurul Samsina Muhammad Zaini on this occasion. Dr. Nurul Samsina is senior lecturer at the Institute of Biological Sciences, Universitas of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And this event is conducted to enrich the student knowledge as well as to expose students to international caliber uh, scientists at the world international, in which being one of the agenda of UNPAD. Uh, the event will be moderated by Dr. Febri Doni. I thanks once again to Dr. Nurul, who has been willing to share knowledge, her knowledge, and also Dr. Febri who has helped organize this guest lecture. Uh, and I would like to everybody uh, in here to pop, uh, uh, open the uh, in camera of uh, the first. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Perwin, please. You're welcome, Prof. Ratu. Many thanks for your uh, opening remarks. Yeah, very nice and very thoughtful. <laughs> and okay, uh, I would like to introduce our very special speaker today. Yeah. Dr. Nurul Shamjina, Muhammad Suhaimi, yeah. She is a senior lecturer in the Institute of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science, University of Malaya, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Nurul did his first degree uh, in uh, agricultural science from University Putra, Malaysia. And uh, subsequently, uh, he did a uh, her uh, PhD uh, at the uh, Institute of Biological Sciences, University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, her field of interest is plant diseases diagnostics, uh, which is rooted in the intention to contribute to the enhancement of farmers' ability to properly detect, manage, and recover from the devast devastating consequences of plant disease outbreaks. Yeah. Uh, she's really well experienced. Uh, I think uh, her previous work is on banana, banana diseases. Yeah, uh, he's uh, actually uh, she's actually employing the uh, the metagenomics uh, approach in uh, disappearing the 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 uh, banana diseases. Yeah, and also Dr. Norol uh, is currently working on the transcriptomics. I think the metabolomics and studying the, the interaction between rice plants and trichoderma. She is really well experienced then, uh, and hopefully uh, today uh, uh, we can learn a lot from Dr. Nurul. Eh? Okay, uh, I think that's it, the introduction for Dr. Nurul. Um, yeah, if you're, you guys are interested to, to know more about Dr. Nurul, you can uh, send her email eh? and then Maybe you can ask to her about the if he, she has a, a project or a scholarship that maybe you can apply. Okay, uh, Dr. Nurur, are you on the line now? Yes, um, 
I'm going to try and share my screen. All right. So uh, the platform is yours now. Okay, Dr. Nora. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. If the, the student open the camera, it's better. Yes, the student nice. open the camera, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Soalnya buka ini, jangan di, gitu ya. Kameranya dibuka. Okay. All right. Silakan Dr. Nora. Okay, um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Very good morning to everyone. So you all can see my slides? Yes, yes, we can see your slide. Okay, so um, I feel very honored. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction by Dr. Fabry and also Prof. Ratu um, for very much appreciation. Um, I'm really happy, excited uh, to be here with all of you, uh, virtually, right? Um, so, inshallah, um, I'll share some uh, knowledge um, and then uh, my experience in this field with all of you today. And hopefully, it will be beneficial, very useful to all of you, inshallah. So, um, let me share as a slideshow first. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about plant bacterial diseases, traditional and modern diagnostic techniques. Uh, it sounds um, very factual, right? But I'm trying to make it more... Um, I'll be making it more into research instead of just facts, okay? So here's my details. You can see um, I'm working in Institute of Biological Science, Faculty of Science, University of Malaya, and that's my email, like Dr. Fabry mentioned just now. Um, you all can always um, approach me, okay, through email. That will be the best way, right? So, um, introduction. Um, I must... Uh, start with introducing all of you to plant pathology okay before we go into the details of uh, bacterial diseases so plant disease plant pathology a minute yeah i can't see my whole slide because of the i have to hide i, I want to see everybody but it's inter interrupting my slides. I have to hide the Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, plant pathology, continuously disturbed by some causal agents that result in an abnormal physiological process that disrupts the plant's normal structure, growth, function, or other activities. So, plants get sick too, like what you can see from this photo here. Um, like human, they also suffer from diseases. For example, like fever, we suffer from fever, right? So plants also can get fever, but um, they are showing different kind of uh, symptoms. Like us, we might be having high temperature, that kind of thing, right? But for plants, um, their symptoms is more um, on uh, physical appearance, okay? As you can see, abnormal physiological process that uh, not uh, seems uh, normal to the plants, okay? So it affects the structure, growth, function, and the other activities. So um, plant pathology or plant disease, the study of plant diseases. Pathology is derived from the two Greek words, pathos means suffering disease, and logos, uh, study. Okay, so normally uh, different types of study will have this logic at, at the at the end of the terms microbiology uh, virology so meaning that study of something so for pato means uh, disease okay so we we normally um, use different terms for plant pathology like pato, phytopathology phyto for plants and then um, we can simply say plant diseases so everything refers to the same thing okay it is a scientific study of plant diseases caused by pathogens, which is the infectious diseases, and environmental conditions, physiological factors. 
So in uh, plant pathology, it is a very huge topic because it covers um, different types of diseases, not only the one that caused by biotic agents, which is the pathogens, right, where it is infectious, meaning that it can easily spread because there's um, a living agent, which is the biotic agents, right? And then we also need to look into um, abiotic factors. So whatever unfavorable um, environmental conditions also under plant pathology, right? So, but today um, we only focus on um, biotic and then only bacterial. So if we talk about biotic, there's a lot more other um, agents, right? For example, like uh, fungi, um, nematodes, uh, virus. Okay, so many other um, biotic agents. But today I'm focusing more on uh, bacterial diseases. Okay, so going into a bit more detail about plant pathology. So objective of plant pathology, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, it is a huge topic, okay, covering uh, epidemiology, um, etiology, pathogenesis, management and control. So everything under one roof of plant pathology. So the terms like epidemiology, etiology, pathogenesis, uh, closely related to the questions of why and how a certain disease or disorder uh, develops, right? Um, so um, epidemiology, maybe some of you might not be familiar with this kind of term. So epidemiology, epidemiology means um, the occurrence, the spread of the disease, and it leads to how to control, right? How to manage the spread. We, want, we don't want the... Uh, this is to be very severe, covering a large area of certain um, uh, fields, certain uh, plantation, okay? And then um, etiology means the causative agents, okay? So causative agents leads to uh, pathogenesis. So meaning that um, pathogenesis comes after etiology, processes that initiate for etiology, and then maintain and progress the disease, so uh, pathogenesis, okay? Um, so let's look at uh, plant bacterial diseases. So after giving a sort of a general idea about plant uh, pathology and then what are the topics that we cover under plant uh, pathology or plant diseases, so now we want to look into the specific part, which is the bacterial diseases. So first of all, when we talk about um, any plant diseases, we normally think about the signs and symptoms, like human just now when I mentioned about uh, fever. So we will always uh, show signs and symptoms and there will always be the reason behind uh, having such signs and symptoms, right? So the term sign and symptoms, actually two different things for uh, specifically about plant diseases, okay? So um, signs and symptoms, so how do we differentiate? Um, these are the examples of a few um, characteristics of uh, disease plants that we can observe, okay? So uh, we can see from these three photos here um, the difference of signs and symptoms. Bacterial ooze streaming from cut stem and gamosis, okay? Uh, a bacteria exudate emerging from the infected part of the plants is actually the signs. And then... These are the symptoms known as bacterial canker. So how do we differentiate uh, these two terms here, signs and symptoms? For signs, meaning that whatever um, characteristics being uh, expressed by the pathogen itself. Okay, So if you can see this um, ooze, this sort of uh, smoky um, structure coming out from the infected parts and then this... Um, sticky um, structure, right, gooey, that this kind of thing is actually indicates the presence of the bacterial colony in the infected uh, plants, okay? And then uh, symptoms is the one that being exhibited by the host plant itself. So when it is infected, so it shows uh, symptoms. So it expresses the feeling of uneasiness uh, caused by the pathogen. So they will show different different types of symptoms, okay? 
um, for example, like change in color, and then maybe you can see like wilting. Um, this one is just a uh, one name for different types of uh, plant diseases. We have canker, blight, uh, streak. So you will find um, all these uh, names in uh, plant diseases. Okay. Um, so uh, I put here like other symptoms because I cannot put so many uh, photos of different symptoms. But I'm going to um, just uh, categorize into these four broad categories of plant disease uh, symptoms. So normally for bacterial diseases, we will see these uh, four categories. Okay, either vascular wilt, necrosis, soft rot, or tumors. So you can uh, actually find these same symptoms in other a, uh, sorry, biotic agents, for example, like I mentioned this now, fungus or maybe uh, virus, nematodes, they also can give these uh, symptoms. But um, the causative agent is different, okay? But for bacteria, um, these are the four main uh, symptoms. So looking at uh, vascular wilt, okay? So bacterial invasions of the plant's vascular system, the subsequent multiplication and blockage prevents movement of water and nutrients through the xylem of the host plant. So meaning that if it causes wilting, normally it will block the movement of water uh, in the xylem and then cause uh, the plants to um, slowly um, wilt, okay, and then uh, eventually will die. Normally that's, that's how it happens, okay. And then uh, second one, necrosis. So necrosis normally due to secret, uh, secretion of to uh, toxin or poison by the pathogens. Okay, it causes a uh, whole cell death. Okay, and then these are the symptoms, meaning that formation of these spots, specks, stem like canker as a result of um, expressing the the infection. Okay, by the host plants. So these are these are the things that. Uh, that um, caused by the pathogens, they secrete toxin or poison to the plants. Okay, so for soft rot, uh, different way, where the pathogens actually secrete enzyme, normally we uh, call it pectolytic enzyme, and the common genus that can cause these symptoms is actually arrhenia. So that's why I just put an example here, pectolytic enzyme uh, secreted by arrhenia. Okay, so they capable of this uh, decomposing cell wall structures, so destroying the texture, and then the plant tissue becomes macerated, soft and watery. So you can see from the terms also soft rot, so meaning that it causes uh, symptoms that make the plants look uh, soft, um, soggy, okay, and then uh, watery because the structure being destroyed. Okay, the other one is tumors, where the pathogens stimulate uncontrolled multiplication of plant cells, resulting in the formation of abnormally large structures. So it is something like cancer, uh, light overgrowth, okay, known as crown gall. I would say like in, in Asian country, um, crown gall is not so, so common. Okay, whenever I, I teach about this topic, um, these are the, the one that is a bit uncommon to us, but still we have this kind of uh, disease caused by uh, different types of uh, bacteria, okay? Pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so um, these symptoms caused by some bacterial pathogens of plants and representative virulence mechanism. So I also want to share um, a bit about the, the ability of these uh, pathogens to cause disease uh, because they have this um, virulence uh, genes, okay, and then these are the mechanisms. So, um, example like bacterial spike under necrosis, okay, so the common one is pseudomonas, they have this type 3 secretion system, okay, and then crown gall, I mentioned um, the cancer-like uh, structure, so the common uh, genus of uh, plant pathogenic bacteria is agrobacteria, where they have this type 4 secretion system, um, that somehow modify okay, the, the, the genes of the plant cell and it uh, multiply uncontrollably and cause uh, the symptoms. Okay, and then next, uh, black leg. Okay, black leg under. From the picture, we can guess uh, it is a soft rod type, right? So, arrhenia is the common uh, genus having type 2 secretion system 
where they are able to um, secrete enzyme and then degrade the uh, cell wall of the bacteria of the host plants okay and then uh, bacterial wheel okay and the vascular wheel so this is an example of a tomato plant okay if i'm not mistaken um uh, Rastonia solana serum is the common causative agents for bacterial wood in different uh, hosts. Okay, this one tomato, and then we also have banana and other uh, host plants. So it causes blockage, as you can see, they produce exopolysaccharide and then uh, block the uh, water transport system of the plants. Okay, I can't see anyone since I have to hide my zoom. Hopefully, I'm still with all of you. Right, Dr. Fabry? Yeah, yeah. We can still uh, uh, hear you very clearly. Okay, nice. You can go ahead. Okay, sure. So, um, so next, we, we want to go into the diagnostic um, procedure. Okay, so after we, we look at the um, physical um, appearance of the disease, so normally, um, it's hard to, to identify the causative agent. And proper disease diagnosis is vital, as you can see, um, management and control, because whatever disease um, happens to, to our crops, we want to manage and control the disease, right? So normally when we talk to farmers, when they experience um, their crops having a severe disease, so the only thing that they will ask uh, a plant pathologist is how to tackle the problem, how to solve the problem, right? So they want to uh, control and manage uh, so that the disease is not spreading to the whole area, right? But um, disease diagnosis is not a simple thing. Like when you go there and then you can simply say, oh, this is caused by something and then this is how you manage. Yes, you can, you can uh, quickly give um, a solution, a quick and a rapid one to, to the farmers. But normally, we still have to um, bring the, the samples back to lab and then do more thorough um, studies to identify the right pathogens and whatnot. As you can see here, right, neither symptoms nor signs <coughs> sorry, provide enough specific or characteristics information to decide the cause of an infectious plant disease, right? especially if it is infectious. Um, agents. If non-infectious, I mentioned earlier, uh, abiotic agents, so we can easily um, give a solution. For example, like um, excess use of herbicide, that kind of thing. So we just can um, advise not to apply um, excess excessively, right? Or maybe the way they, uh, they apply is wrong, so it's easier to, to give solution. But if it is infectious uh, disease caused by pathogen, so we first need to identify the causative agents. Okay, so it may be necessary to bring a sample back to the laboratory for further tests um, to isolate and identify the causal agent. So um, it is normal to mention that this would be time consuming and labor intensive and take specialized skills, right? So that's why this kind of um, study can can be done as a master or sometimes even PhD uh, study, depending on the, the um, um, work that, that will be done. Okay? Either it is something that is um, new causative agents, so we need to identify, we need to really characterize the causative agents, or it is something that common, you just have to identify, uh, you just have to isolate and then identify again, and then maybe just do, um, uh, artificial inoculation where I will touch that later on to just prove that this is the um, culprit of the disease, okay? Okay, so looking at um, plant disease diagnosis, as, as the title mentioned, traditional and modern phytopathology diagnosis. So we always have this traditional and modern, and modern normally rapid uh, identification, I would say. But uh, to be honest with you, we still need to, to do all these traditional uh, tests before we can actually uh, do the modern diagnosis, okay? 
So one uh, very traditional is visual assessment, right? Uh, where you just go to, to the field and then you observe and then you try to identify. And then um, I would say that this visual assessment actually best done by the farmers, the owner of the field itself because uh, they are the one who knows their plants very well, right? They, they grow the plants and then they know what kind of um, seeds they use, what kind of management that they apply in their field. So when they uh, tweak their, their management, um, their, the way they manage their field, or what are the things that they apply, so they, they will um, sort of able to predict what will happen, okay? And then they will be able to identify that there's something abnormal or something wrong with their field. Um, but to, to a plant pathologist or to, uh, uh, to do diagnostic diagnosis, okay? So the easy way of uh, visual assessment is for, for bacterial plant disease, especially uh, to do stem streaming tests. As I shown uh, earlier, where bacteria uh, disease normally have this gooey, uh, smoky uh, liquid uh, structure that will flow out from the infected part. So we can actually do this stem streaming test. I will show the photo later to, to um, show you all how to do this stem streaming test and how's the result, okay? And then microscopy also. Microscopy, um, we, need, we need, of course, we need... Um, uh, a microscope, okay, meaning that we need something, a gadget, so we need to bring back the samples to lab and then uh, prepare, do a simple preparation of the samples and then we view under microscope to see uh, the signs of the disease, okay, meaning that we want to identify whether there's any uh, positive agents or not where we can find from the infected part. And culture-based bacterial isolation and identification. This is the common uh, method used where we have to isolate and then we identify the um, pure cultures. Okay? So we normally use selective, semi-selective media followed by biochemical tests in order to um, uh, lower the number of isolates. Okay? So to be more specific on certain um, putative agents of the disease, and then followed by pathogenicity tests because we want to prove that the one that we isolate actually the one that caused disease uh, in the field. So this is something that normally um, we do, the process that we do from getting the samples from the field until um, proof that this is the causative agents of the disease, that kind of thing. And apart from, from doing all these uh, sort of traditional uh, methods, we also have many modern and rapid techniques, okay, where we can simply use this kind of um, lateral flow immunoassay tree. So it is something like what we practice now for COVID, okay, we just have a strip and then we take the samples and then we dip into the samples, that kind of thing, and then we detect the presence of the pathogen. So we can simply um, conclude that there's a pathogen present uh, because of these certain symptoms and then uh, perhaps we need to bring back to the lab and then we isolate and make sure that uh, we manage to get the pure cultures of the pathogen. And then utilization of several carbon sources analysis. So this is actually a follow-up from culture base. Um, where you already isolate and then you have the pure culture. So you use these biolog kits to um, identify. So this is the identification part. And then nucleic acid-based methods also to identify where we use species-specific genes um, uh, using polymerase change reaction technique, or we can also use multiplex in order to identify few different uh, pathogens that present in the samples. So, um, why I put red here for nucleic acid-based methods because it can be um, a quick diagnostic method or it can be the one that follow the culture-based method where we already isolate and we have the pure cultures of the putative pathogen and then we use this uh, PCR technique just to show that this uh, pure isolate is the causative agent 
or we can actually um, extract DNA from the samples and just use species specific primers to identify identify the presence of the pathogen. So meaning that we don't isolate, we just take the whole sample, the, we call it a total genomic DNA from the samples and then we identify the presence. But if we manage to culture, so meaning that we have the culture and then we identify using PCR technique. That, uh, that, that's the, the meaning, okay? So, and then rapid diagnostic tool for stem streaming tests and LFIA any immunodiagnostic uh, technique is a rapid diagnostic tool because you can do it uh, on the field. So for example, like you take a, 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 an infected part and then you dip in the water. Okay, I'll show the photo, I think after, after this uh, slide. Okay, so like this. Okay, so this is the um, immunodiagnostic uh, assay, okay, and then the streaming test is the one that I've shared earlier, okay, where I show the tomato um, stem deep into a water, and then you can see the, the bacteria streaming out, the bacteria who's streaming from the infected part. And then uh, this one, so you just uh, collect the infected uh, parts of the plants, and then you crush, and then you put in this uh, prepared plastic containing uh, certain certain uh, chemicals, uh, liquid inside. And then you dip the uh, strip and then you can see the um, line being uh, present here. So it shows positive uh, result, the presence of the causative agents. Okay, so um, these are the examples of visual symptoms, right? So meaning that you just go to the field and then you observe any abnormal uh, conditions and then you um, predict okay, this must be something uh, caused by uh, causative agents, uh, biotic agents, because you can see the pattern, that kind of thing. So you start your prediction. okay, And then you will bring back the samples of the infected parts and then you do isolation on uh, this media, okay, normally uh, we will refer to um, uh, published papers uh, about the, the related disease before we decide what kind of media that we should use in order to isolate the uh, bacteria, okay, because we don't want to just simply use a very general media and you will get many other um, commensals and other microbes that present in the samples, so it's hard to to detect the presence of the causative agents, okay? So here I put bacterial leaf light. These are the example of one disease happened in our country, in rice, okay? It can be caused by Xanthomonas oryzae, Patova oryzae, or Pantoa. So I will share my experience working in this uh, uh, kind of disease later on, and then I will explain further why the causative agent can be different, okay? And then this one also um, something that I did before as well, uh, Rastonia solanaceum that caused bacterial wilt in banana. Okay, so this is the pure cultures uh, in in different media actually. So this one there's no pigment being produced because this is a bit uh, general media. And normally we use this uh, TZC. It is a bit more uh, selective so that you can see the pigment being produced, so you can claim that it is a putative uh, pathogenic agent, okay? And then like I mentioned just now, this is a rapid diagnostic tool where you can do quickly after you bring back the samples, you crush, and then you do this uh, test first before you actually isolate your rastonia, that kind of thing. Okay, <clears throat> so... Uh, Follow um, more examples, okay? So like I mentioned just now, uh, microscopy. So this is what happened. As you can see, these are the uh, different parts of the, the infected uh, plants, okay? And then uh, this uh, researcher here trying to observe under microscope and see um, presence of any... Um, uh, agents, causative agents. So, determine morphology, the shape and size of the pathogen from the infected plant parts. And this is not easy also. It needs a skilled person, right? 
and uh, we normally don't um, observe the infected parts. We normally isolate and then only we observe the pure cultures. Uh, so at least we are looking at one type of bacteria rather than like many other bacteria on the surface of the infected uh, plant parts. Okay, and sharing with you um, pathogenicity test just now, right? So here under this um, method, okay. So after we we got all the pure cultures and then we managed to identify either using uh, biochemical tests, which is very traditional technique, or we simply use PCR and then we identify the positive agents. We prove that um, using blasts and whatnot that this is the positive agent. So we need to finally um, test in a lab, okay, in, in, a, in a control condition using artificial inoculation technique uh, to show that that's the isolate that we manage to isolate from the field and then we purify and then we test on the plants and it causes the same disease that we observe in the field okay so these are the things that uh, we did okay my student did for bacterial leaf flight so this is the rice plants and this is the uh, clipping method we call it clipping method so cut the plant um, to to produce a wound and then uh, dig into the bacterial suspension Okay, and then this is the one I did, but I don't have the photo, so I just take some somewhere an example where we actually inoculate the stem. So this one I think um, papaya, right? But what I did uh, with uh, my rastonia is using uh, banana. So same method where we inject the bacterial suspension into the plants, and then we observe uh, the symptoms. Okay. Um, and talking about pathogenicity tests, we have to prove these principles of cautious postulates. So these are the things that still happen until today. When we report new disease, uh, we have to follow these steps, starting from isolation and then purification, um, identification using different techniques. And then we have to uh, do this pathogenicity test and we have to fulfill this proper criteria designed to verify that the microorganism is the causal agent for the disease. So this, uh, these are the four criteria that we need to follow. The suspected pathogen must be consistently associated with the disease plant. So when we do uh, artificial inoculation, we must be able to observe the symptoms, right? The microorganism must be isolated from the disease organism and grown in pure culture. This is what we did uh, previously, right? The cultured microorganism should cause disease when inoculated into a healthy organism. So this is the artificial inoculation that we do. And then the microorganism must be re-isolated from the inoculated plant and grown in pure culture again and should have the same characteristics with the original culture that we inoculate into the healthy plant. So this is the steps that we, that we need to follow when we do a plant pathogenicity test or we can say plant disease diagnostic uh, techniques okay, in lab. Okay, so sharing with you um, a few case studies, uh, I can say that this is what we did uh, in our lab together with Dr. Fabry. As he mentioned earlier, um, a good friend, we, we are a good friend, like uh, we, we did a few studies together. So bacterial disease of bananas, uh, I'm taking examples from other paper and then bacterial leaf blood of rice also comparing other different uh, uh, studies, okay? So talking about this bacterial disease of bananas and NSAID, current state of knowledge and integrated approach approaches toward sustainable management. So this is the title of the paper. Um, I'm trying to acknowledge the paper because I'm taking all these photos from this paper. So if you're interested, to know more about uh, these banana diseases caused by bacteria, you can refer to the paper. And I'm sharing uh, this paper because I want to highlight, um, I, I can say that one type of disease but can be caused by many uh, different pathogens. Okay, looking at this uh, photo here, this is the first one here. So this is bacterial wilt caused by xanthomonas. Okay, these are the the symptoms that you can uh, see, the bacterial ooze from the infected uh, stem. 
So it a bit it, it is a bit yellowish, okay, Xanthomonas. Um, it causes bacterial wilt. Generally, we can see this bacterial wilt. But of course, uh, some countries will have their special name. Okay, like example here, this is Moko and Baktok. Okay, so same causative agent, which is Rastonia solanaceum, um, causing the same symptoms, but the name is different. One is Moko and another one is Baktok. Okay. Uh, Baktok in Philippines and Moko more to Western countries, okay? Um, so, um, yeah, I have my, my son here. Okay, uh, so um, what did I mention just now? So this is Antomonas and this is Rastonia. So two different uh, genera but causing bacterial wilt in banana and of course in different countries. So uh, Xanthomonas so far can be found only in African countries and we don't have it here in our country yet as far as I know. Uh, but Moko, we already have, in Indonesia we already have Moko. I'm not sure about Indonesia, but let's look at another one. Um, this is blood disease, okay? So firstly, um, it is found in Indonesia, uh, blood disease bacterium, BDB caused by Rastonia saizaigi, a closely related um, species or genus of Solanaceum just now. And uh, to my surprise, when I did the study, actually we managed to find this uh, saizaigi in our country. So it caused all these same symptoms, okay, where the fruits will be um, rot like this, okay. And it normally um, causes more severe disease in uh, variety Nipah. In our country, we call it Nipah. I think Abu or something uh, that is more familiar to uh, Indonesian, that, that name, that variety. Okay. So now in our country, we have Moko, caused by Rastonia Sulanaciarum, being reported by many uh, researchers in Asia, and also um, this BDB, blood disease bacter bacterium, or the blood disease. Uh, symptoms caused by Rastonia saizaigi, okay? And uh, this is another one. So this is also uncommon so far, as I know, caused by arrhenia, and because it is caused by arrhenia, the symptoms might be uh, same, like wilting, but it is actually soft rot, okay? Because arrhenia, so it causes soft rot. Uh, but when we look um, quickly at the symptoms, we might think that it is wilt but it's actually soft rot. So closely um, uh, related symptoms, I would say. And this is arrhenia, but arrhenia is the, the um, old names. And now people call it decaya. And also another causative agent is bacterium. So many different um, genera causing almost the same symptoms. So this is the reason why diagnosis is very important where we bring back the samples and then we identify the causative agents. That, that's uh, one of the main things. So that we can clearly claim that this specific disease caused by uh, what uh, causative agents, okay? So another one, bacterial leaf flight of rice, okay? So commonly known um, that it is caused by Xanthomonas oryzae, Patova oryzae. So if you um, Google bacterial leaf flight of rice, Normally, you can find this um, causative agent, which is Xanthomonas oryzae, Patova oryzae. But looking at this uh, site here, okay, so you can see that many papers report that this disease is caused by different types of Pentoa uh, species, okay, Pentoa agglomerans, Ananatis, Tewatai. So, my student also did this uh, study. And in the first place, we thought that it should be Xanthomonas and end up, we found out that it is a Pentover species, okay? And more and more studies uh, prove that Pentover is the causative agents in their countries, as you can see, Korea, Berlin, India, Togo, China, and many more down there. Okay, I just, I just select a few here. Uh, but for plant pathologists, uh, they generally say that the main causative agent is still Xanthomonas. So there's a, a big question here. How come this pentower can, can become a pathogen 
and cause the same symptoms to rise as well. Okay. So, um, sort of ending my uh, presentation today, I, I want to just um, open your mind that uh, we have to look at a broader perspective. Okay. Uh, after looking at these different types of uh, plant diseases, uh, we still do um, identify the causative agents. For example, like we have uh, bacterial root of banana in our country, and then we go into uh, finding the causative agent, and we found out that it, it is sometimes Rastonia solanum serum and sometimes Rastonia syzygi. And then when we have this bacterial leaf blight, so we, at first we thought it is Anthomonas and then end up it is Pentoel. We still look at the pathogen and then we still do uh, all the, the diagnostic uh, steps that I mentioned earlier, where we isolate, we purify, and then we identify and then we test, um, we do artificial inoculation in order to prove that it caused disease in, in a controlled environment, right? But, um, Actually, when we do the test, it's not as, as easy as we plan. Sometimes when we um, isolate and then we identify, like I mentioned, we can't find the pathogen, the, the, the target pathogen. Uh, and then we find out something else and it is abundant. So we wonder like whether this is the causative agents. And then when we do a pathogenicity test, sometimes we cannot see the symptoms. Um, and then end up we might be... Um, creating a, a sort of um, unfavorable conditions to the plants so that it will somehow produce the symptoms, you see? So this is the reason why I introduced this plant disease triangle here as, as a perspective for this topic, where every um, plant disease and the, the severity of the plant disease contributed by this three um, uh, category here, okay, pathogen, environment, host, so pathogen, it must be virulence, it must be abundance in order to cause the disease. And then environment, uh, the condition must be uh, favorable to the pathogen, okay? Favorable to the pathogen, not to the plant, so that the pathogen can easily propagate and cause symptoms. And then the host also must be susceptible in order for the disease to be severe. Okay, so um, these are the things that we might want to consider, like opportunistic pathogens, okay? So at first, it's just a commensal. And then when uh, the condition's favorable, so they can cause disease. They can be uh, virulent, okay? They can, they can uh, cause the plants to show symptoms of disease. And then, of course, something that we cannot control, climate change, right, where the environment is favorable for the pathogen to cause disease. Okay, so and then it causes severe disease to the plants, and then susceptible host. So susceptible host is meaning that the plant is weak. The plant itself is weak. The condition is not favorable for the plants to grow, um, and then the environment is also not supporting the growth of the plants, and then it causes uh, pathogen to easily uh, attack and infect the plants and cause the plants to show symptoms. So perhaps this is something that we need to, to tackle. Okay, We need to make our plants, our crops um, more resistant to the disease. We cannot uh, control uh, climate, right? But we also can control pathogen. We, we can uh, reduce the amount of pathogen in, in our field uh, so that our plants won't easily get infected. And apart from that, we make that our we make our host more resistant. And this is something that's a bit hard for us to control. But we can prepare the field to be um, favorable for the plant growth, make sure the soil is uh, suitable, the conditions suitable, the pH, the, the um, uh, water system and whatnot to make sure that the condition favorable to the host and not favor favorable to the pathogen and then we might be able to reduce the disease severity okay um so this is another some uh, things that that i want to share as a perspective of this topic so this is the paper that we published together me and dr february association of pentawa with rice plants 
either they are friends or foes, right? So we we um, know that Zatomonas is the causative agent, and then suddenly now man, many researchers uh, report Pantoa. So are they suddenly become an enemy to rice? So uh, we highlighted that many factors determine the outcome of Pantoa rice interaction, specific strain of Pantoa that harbor beneficial or pathogenic traits. So they might be uh, opportunistic pathogens, right? And then the fitness and physiological status of the rice plants, uh, the one that I've mentioned, the susceptible uh, host okay, that can make the pantoa easily um, colonize and cause disease to the plants. And the external factors such as environmental conditions and another interesting topic to include in plant disease um, study is the microbial communities, meaning that other microbes in the in that area that can somehow um, cause the symptoms to be more severe because they support the, the causative agents or they are the one that help to reduce the number of the pathogens and make the plants uh, uh, more resistant to the pathogen. Okay, And this is another study of mine where I, I accidentally found a lot of um, commensals or other bacteria that happens to be isolated from the disease plants. And then what I did, um, I see the effects of combining this um, non-pathogen with the pathogen and see the, the severity of the disease. Okay, so I just share the photo because I can remember a few that I want to highlight here. So this is the positive control, meaning that we artificially inoculate the pathogen Okay, and then um, these are the other treatments where I combine the pathogen with my other isolates. So as you can see, um, I have like some plants that have a less severe symptoms, although the same pathogens. And this one, treatment five, uh, combined with one of the isolate that um, found abundantly in the uh, infected uh, plants, and then it caused uh, severe symptoms. Okay, If you can see, you compare with the, the positive control, this is even more severe. Same time, same uh, inoculation technique, uh, same environment. So this might be giving us uh, some ideas, perhaps those that are abundance, uh, microbes that found together with the pathogens somehow can actually uh, promote the pathogens to cause more severe disease. Okay, um, but I did I didn't um, continue with this project uh, due to many reasons. But I'm really interested to go further to combine more microbes and then perhaps like now people are doing metagenomics or the omics uh, things to see uh, microbes as a whole that present in the in the environment rather than like what we did before we culture and then we just select a few and then we test. Uh, perhaps like when we look at the broader perspective, um, the whole microbial community, so we can see many other interesting um, findings. Okay? So um, that's all from me. Thank you for listening. Um, it's a bit weird, you cannot see everybody and just like talking to my laptop. But I hope um, you all follow the whole presentation and it is some, uh, it can uh, spark your interest, give you some ideas, open your mind about um, plant disease diagnostic. With that, thank you. And these are more details about me. Um, under UM, we have this UM expert uh, website where you can go into this uh, website and look for uh, researchers in UM. Okay. That's all, Dr. Fabry. Thank you so much. Um... Thank many thanks, uh, Dr. Nurur, for your very thoughtful and very interesting talk. Yeah? So we actually learned a lot of perspective from you, yeah? especially on how uh, disease can be developed and uh, what is the uh, diagnostics uh, approaches to uh, understand the disease, to detect the disease. Yeah. So um, you guys, if you have questions, yeah, you can drop your question on the comment yeah? uh, box. Yeah. Or else you can also uh, raise your hand if you have a question to be asked to the general. Okay, um, we have a one question here. 
on chat, but I will ask some question to the general first. Yeah, you know, uh, Palmer's asked me about uh, why it's so difficult to uh, control the diseases in plants, yeah, especially in rice. Yeah, uh, humankind uh, had been to uh, to the moon in seventies, yeah, but in two thousand twenty two, we are still uh, difficult to uh, control the plants' diseases. Yeah. So uh, can you share us a uh, perspective why it's so difficult to uh, to uh, control the diseases yeah, in plants? Because, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, farmers really are suffering a lot because of the uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria in plants. So what can you share to us your perspective about this, Dr. Nero? Okay, yeah. Being, I think like Dr. Fabry also um, approach towards organic farming using biological control, right? And we know that uh, for a very long time, people are actually using a lot of chemicals in their field. Because uh, at first, we, we start with biological controls because long time ago, um, our ancestors, they don't have chemicals, right? So they control with whatever that far, that can be found around them, right? And then once like uh, chemicals being introduced, so people can see the very fast effects of chemicals in controlling disease, in promoting the growth of plants. <clears throat> and at one time, people use it uh, excessively without uh, bothering about the, the condition of the soil, the environment, right? And now only, I think like, this uh, couple of years recently, people start to move back to biological controls, move back to organic ways um, of managing their fields. Okay, so um, um, to to comment on your question or your your thoughts just now, uh, Dr. February, I think the reason why it's hard to control the, the disease nowadays. One thing that we cannot control is the climate change, whatever that happens around us, drought, flood, that suddenly happened to us, even in Malaysia also. Last time we don't really have a very um, uh, severe conditions of uh, weather, but now nowadays like suddenly it's very hot and suddenly it, it becomes like rainy all, all days. So um, that's actually promote uh, the propagation of the microbes, the pathogens especially, right? And then um, because of the soil condition that is not favorable to the plants anymore because of the use of chemicals, uh, excessive chemicals by the farmers quite some time ago. So um, it promotes the pathogens to, to grow more and more and to cause uh, severe disease. And when we want to tackle the problems, we want to manage, we have to uh, solve many problems. Maybe uh, first we have to look at the soil, we have to improve the soil. And improving soil using biocontrol technique is not easy, it will take some time, right? You can't simply say that you apply certain biocontrol agents today and then tomorrow you can see the effects. It might take a few seasons, right? And then normally farmers, they don't, really want to hear that they want a very fast solution so uh, it's hard to change um, the, the farmer's perspective in in using uh, more friendly environmental friendly uh, solutions right so some of them still prefer chemicals because they want um, fast solution that kind of thing and uh, i would say like um, <clears throat> sharing all this kind of knowledge to, to those people will be very useful, right? So we have to explain to them that they should know their fields are experiencing um, very severe conditions, stress conditions where they cannot see, uh, support the growth of their crops anymore. So they have to do something with the uh, soil first, something like that. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I think uh, we can uh, uh, see the question on the on the chat yeah? from Ineke. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Nurul, for giving the le lecture about the plant disease. It's really new information and new knowledge for me. 
I have a few questions uh, for the general. You talk about the crown gall disease symptom that actually still common in Asia. Can you actually uh, the crown gall be treated? Can the uh, crown gall be treated? Okay, the first question. And second question is, what media that you often use to grow, to grow bacterial diseases? Or what do you think is the best selective media to grow bacterial disease? And the third question is, you also talk about Xanthomonas earlier. I once heard that Xanthomonas decide act as a pathogenic bacteria for plant. It also can be useful for bioproduct. Is there any possibilities to make that, that happen in Asia? So we know that the, the bacteria is still not common to be found in Asia. Thank you very much. Okay. okay Dr. Nero, yeah. Actually, I can see the, the question or else I cannot answer <laughs> all the three together. Um, okay, the first one about crown gall. So I, I've mentioned it's not common and I never worked with crown gall before. Um, so it caused like tumor uh, in plants, right? Cancer-like overgrowth in plants. So in order to treat, um, I can give a very specific uh, ways. I mean like, based on studies or whatnot. But uh, talking about uh, managing plant diseases generally, okay, there are many ways to manage cultural control, chemical, biological. So um, perhaps it involves all that also in, in controlling um, any types of diseases. Okay, So culture control mean, meaning that we don't uh, apply anything, but we just manage. The disease not to spread quickly so for example like we remove the disease plants and then we um, <clears throat> uh, prepare the the soil or the the place that we, where we want to to plant our crops uh, in a favorable condition like i mentioned so we try to to reduce or to remove whatever pathogens that might be possible to grow there. Uh, and then perhaps like based on a previous experience, for example, like you plant something and then you observe the symptoms on that plant. So you look for other alternative uh, plants in the second season where you don't plant the same crops that can have that symptoms. You plant other crops that cannot be uh, infected by that pathogen. So this is how actually we do cultural control. Okay, and then if let's say um, biochemical, uh, sorry, uh, chemical or biological control. So this is uh, the, the things that I, I quickly mentioned just now, answering uh, or commenting on Dr. Fabri's question, where we apply chemicals to reduce the presence of the pathogen. Or um, we use biocontrol. Biocontrol, normally we, we apply before uh, we observe the, the symptoms meaning that we already give something for the plants to protect themselves, to, to uh, give resistance ability to the plants, so that when that's pathogen, so they won't be showing very severe symptoms, that kind of thing. Or we treat, meaning that we already see the symptoms and then we apply something, uh, bioagents, just to minimize the, the severity. So at least we can still harvest uh, the, the products, but um, maybe in a lesser amount or something, that kind of thing. So I, I'm not answering directly about crown gall, but this is generally the management and control of plant diseases because I'm not familiar with this disease, okay? Um, and then media, you asked about media. Mm, so uh, like I quickly mentioned in my presentation just now, we normally um, we, we have to read first about the, the disease and then the common causative agents that other people, other researchers found. So we will see like what are the media they, they use. So I can't say that that's specific media for all different um, diseases, plant diseases, meaning that for all different causative agents. Like what we use for Rastonia, we use a, a TZC the transolium chloride uh, media, so where it can produce, uh, this uh, pathogen will produce this pigment and then we can see uh, easily see that this is the repetitive agent. 
But then if you if you study about bacterial leaf blight, uh, even Santomonas or Pentoa, we will start with um, TSA, right? The Fabry. The Fabry also involved in that project. So we yeah, use TSA. Yeah. yeah. Although it's a uh, general media, but it is um, a recommended media to start with for bacterial leaf blight. So uh, that's why we need to follow with other tests like biochemical tests or you can simply um, isolate a few and then you do quick identification using PCR and whatnot. So that, that's the, the process of um, identification of the pathogens. Okay, and then yeah, Xanthomona. So um, yeah, this is something interesting about Xanthomonas. So I have a, a colleague at my... Uh, department also, uh, she's studying about Zantan gum. I think that that's the things that you mentioned. You're trying to say here, the byproducts, right? So, yeah, yeah Zantomonas can also uh, produce Zantan gum, which is uh, a useful byproducts. So, like, I um, quickly showed to all of you just now about Pentoa, right? So, we can find Pentoa that can cause disease in plants, but we also can find Pentoa that is actually beneficial to the plants. So microbes, they are very uh, versatile, I would say. So they can be um, disadvantaged in one way and advantages in another way. So I think that's a very quick answer, a general answer to, to your question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Nuro. Okay, is there any more question from the audience? You can raise your hand if you have question. All right, I will ask a question about the preventing the disease. Yeah, we keep talking about the treating the disease. Yeah, is there any way? I just wondering, is there any way to prevent the disease, like uh, making vaccine for plants? Is is that possible to prevent the disease? You know, we keep talking about the treating the disease and what approach that to, to be used to treating the disease. But I was wondering, is there any possibility to uh, really uh, prevent the disease, such as making a vaccine for plants? What do you think, Dr. Nuro? Yeah, okay. I think you have your personal opinion about vaccine to plants. I never um, go into the details about looking into vaccines for plants, but when we um, say about preventing the spread of the disease, I will be uh, more interested to mention about uh, resistance of plants towards the disease, right? So we um, can actually make the plant more um, resistant. So even that's pathogen. So if let's say we look at the, the disease triangle again, right? So in order for the disease to occur and become severe, it involves these three main factors. And actually, there are many other that they included time, human, many other things. But I think it falls in one of these categories also. So um, uh, resistance post. So we need to increase this part in order to um, reduce the severity. That is something that we can think about. Um, the pathogen might be there, okay, but if the plant is strong enough to protect themselves, perhaps the disease won't be easily spread, right? And that environment also, we, even though it is something that we cannot easily control, but we still can prevent disease by preparing a very favorable conditions for the plants and very unfavorable favorable conditions for the pathogens, meaning that we make sure that the water system, uh, perfect soil in perfect condition, uh, contains a lot of organic matters, contains a lot of nutrients for the plant. Um, we put a lot of biological agents into the soil, so we make sure that um, they can also help plants to uh, grow uh, strong um, resistance and then so perhaps this is how we can actually prevent. Of course, if there's uh, suddenly something bring the pathogen, introduce the pathogen into the field, so this is the things that we cannot control. But um, 
I would say like our biosecurity system, that kind of thing. I, I'm not sure about Indonesia, but I think Malaysia, we don't really have a very strong biosecurity system. Uh, I think that's the reason why suddenly we have BDP in Malaysia. Before this, everybody knows that it's MOFO, MOFO, and suddenly when you do identification, it's actually size IG that causes BDP. So how come our banana will be infected by a pathogen that is not being um, uh, called that originally from our country? So I think biosecurity system is also another way to prevent, meaning that we try to avoid uh, pathogen from coming into our area in, in a broader way in our country, but uh, looking at the more specific uh, ways to the farmers. So prevent from anything that can cause the pathogens to come to your feel that kind of thing. Mm. All right. Thank you, Dr. Is there any more question from the from the audience? Sulis, do you have a question? Can see Sulis here, do we? Um, no, pa. Okay. Uh, okay, is, okay, I will. Okay, I will ask one more question about uh, breeding. Yeah, um, I came across and read an article about how CRISPR uh, Cas9 can be used to uh, to actually uh, tackle the disease in plants. Yeah, so because our breeding program is, I would I, I would not say that I wouldn't say that it's failed, but it's actually the breeding program is not really successful. Yeah, to uh, to actually uh, limit the disease in plants. So uh, what do you think? Is there, is that the CRISPR-Cas9 can be a future solution for uh, not only treating the disease, but also producing the plants that really can resist to the certain diseases in plants? What do you think, Tonoro? Okay, um, that's uh, sort of genetics, more, more into genetics. And to be honest, I'm not a very expert in that field. But uh, I, I also know a few uh, friends of mine who work uh, on genetics part where they produce um, transgenic plants. Okay, uh, and, and they successfully produce uh, transgenic plants that are able to 100% resist uh, disease, the, the uh, resistance to a uh, few diseases. Uh, if I'm taking rice as an example, so whatever disease that we commonly found in rice, they claim that their transgenic plants are able to <coughs> overcome that uh, pathogens. And then um, also produce a very high yield, uh, tough, uh, generally speaking, but the problem is that um, transgenic plants is not accepted in certain countries, right? Even in Malaysia also. So when they, they do this kind of fundamental studies, they manage to uh, get the genes. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Bridgley, I'm not very, very good to comment about CRISPR-Cas9. I heard that, that terms, but I don't have much knowledge. So perhaps I'm just giving a very general comments about transgenic plants. Hope you don't mind. Um, so yeah, back to transgenic uh, plants just now. So they, they do all these um, fundamental studies, uh, introduce very different types of genes in the plants and then do lab uh, analysis up to a glass house experiment. So they can prove that their plants under this um, control environment are able to resist whatever disease and produce a very high yield but it's not possible to bring to the field level because um, people are scared when they heard the word transgenic, you know? So, <clears throat> um, I, I don't know, like, if, if you ask my personal opinion, I'm not, like, 100% against trans transgenic plants. It's just that we need to know in what ways these uh, plants being uh, modified. GMO, for example, right? So in what ways um, they are being modified and what are the, the uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, consequence of, of applying these plants? Maybe we have to, to test all these 
before um, actually people can accept, I think. Hmm. Okay, I think one more question about your uh, research on banana. Yeah? I'm just curious about um, uh, why uh, plants that are, which are grown in the more diverse environment, more diverse in terms of microbial yeah? diversity, yeah? tend to uh, resist to the uh, disease, yeah? tend to uh, better uh, uh, re resist to the disease, certain diseases. From mm -hmm. your experience, can you uh, can you give to us your perspective why? Okay, so yeah, true. Uh, nowadays, like uh, like I mentioned, we are looking at the omics uh, technologies, right? Uh, metagenomics, transcriptomics, uh, proteomics, metabolomics. So we want to look at the um, environment or the area as a whole. We're not looking at one specific pathogens or specific microbes. So we are looking at the microbial communities. And like Dr. Fabry mentioned just now, we found out that if uh, there are more diverse abundance of microbes in that field or in that specific plants, uh, the uh, rhizospheric area, so somehow um, they are become more tolerant towards the disease compared to the one that having uh, very specific microbes. Um, so this shows that microbes actually play a vital role in, in protecting the plants from a certain disease, okay? But <clears throat> I can't like uh, give a very clear um, uh, findings based on, on research, just a general one. Uh, I think people are now trying to prove that if you have a very diverse abundance of microbes in certain area, you might be able to actually uh, make the plants uh, more uh, resistant towards the disease and um, you are making the environment, the, the, the area more um, favorable to the plants, something like that. So, uh, like uh, monoculture. So monoculture, we, we are planting the same crops uh, again and again. So it creates a less diverse uh, microbes in that area, right? And then we can easily see that if there's a disease and it can easily spread because the, the condition at that specific area all the same with the very less diverse microbes. So if we do all this um, uh, intercropping, okay, we are introducing more diverse microbes uh, into the area, so sometimes you can actually reduce the, the disease uh, 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 severity in that area, so something like that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nuro. Is there any more question from the audience? From audience, maybe, Nabila, do you have question? Okay, is, is there is no more question, I think I will uh close the webinar today thank you very much dr Nero. maybe prof ratu do you have something to to say for the final one uh your 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 still yeah okay mute okay prof yeah uh, very interesting presentation yeah uh dr dr Nero, yeah uh, in Indonesia, maybe it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, we can use uh, Indonesia. The neuro very good in Indonesia. <laughs> she understands Indonesia very well. Okay, okay. Prof. Ratu, uh, silakan. To Bandung, yeah. Yeah, Serumpun, right? Serumpun. Uh, uh, in next, next, uh, you can come to Bandung. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm very excited if we can meet yeah. physically one day. Okay, baby. Uh, we, we can invite uh, Dr. Nurul to Jatinangor, yeah? Uh, yeah, we can invite Dr. Nurul uh, to Bandung to impact, yeah. Uh, like uh, research collaboration, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Nurul, uh, 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 dan ini membuka wawasan open mind to our student uh, that uh, for, uh, for biology, yeah, for biology processing, yeah. Uh, jadi, 
uh, ini akan memberikan apa uh, wawasan wawasan it's in English uh, apa knowledge ya yeah, knowledge ya yeah. uh, hmm. untuk mahasiswa kami dan tentu akan membuat suatu Uh, proposal-proposal baru yang dari perspektif yang Dokter Nur uh, presentasikan, gitu ya. Uh, karena di Indonesia ini memang banyak sekali uh, permasalahan, terutama di dalam hal uh, itu itu patogen, itu patogen, ya, uh, untuk uh, beberapa komoditi yang yang sangat uh, komersial dan itu masih membutuhkan uh, apa? Uh, antimikroba natural yang yang eh, natural yang bisa digunakan atau diaplikasikan di application seperti itu ya demikian uh, Pak Febri. Oke okay. terima kasih Prof Ratu terima kasih Dr Nurul dan terima kasih semuanya for joining us today ya yeah. very very interesting and very thoughtful uh, talk by Dr Nurul ya yeah. dan hopefully Uh, we can get uh, perspective dari uh, Dr. Nurul presentation tadi. Dan seperti yeah. yang Prof. Ratu bilang, that uh, maybe uh, dari uh, presentation Dr. Nurul tadi, kita bisa apa, get the perspective, get the new knowledge that we can use to uh, maybe for writing proposal, to do research, then also to do uh, more interesting uh, studies and research in the future, okay? Dan uh, ya, kalau tulis proposal berkaitan penyakit uh, banana, uh, sebabnya uh, I really interested to uh -huh. actually look at the BDB in in Indonesia and the one that we have in Malaysia. Um, when I uh, include BDB in this slide, so so I was thinking about. Uh, collaboration with uh, Indonesian people to to study about that. Insyaallah, in future, we, if we have uh, the opportunities, I think yeah, it's very good. Like uh, apa, uh, collaboration and yeah, you know, Prof Ratu, we're not talking about million. Uh, she can get like billion billion rupiah. Prof Ratu, <laughs> she has a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking about billion, yeah, Prof Ratu. We're talking about billion. <laughs> so maybe uh, me and Dr. Noro, yeah, in the future, maybe uh, uh, Prof. Ratu, we can like collaborate for a proposal, yeah? especially on yang Dr. Noro uh, talked tadi about the banana disease. Yeah? Okay? Again, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, terima kasih, Dr. Noro. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Ratu. Nice meeting you. And nice meeting you again, Dr. Fabri and all yeah. of you. <laughs> okay, semuanya. Uh, That's it, our uh, webinar today. Uh, very, very thoughtful and very, very, I enjoying so much this webinar. Yeah. Again, yeah. once more time, terima kasih Dr. Nurul, terima kasih Prof. Ratu, yeah. dan terima kasih semuanya ya, yeah, for joining us today. Yeah. Eh, kita Jadi, belum foto, uh, foto dulu. Oke, okay, uh, yeah. kita foto dulu ya. Yeah. Yes, uh, Akila, you can make a picture for us. Akila? Akila. Akila. Halo. Akila. Oke, kalau eh, kalau Ak Oke, okay, kalau Ak Akila? Bisa silakan Akila. Oh, ada Prof Nia juga. Halo Prof Nia. Dan Ayo. ada Rizky di sini, my friend. Yang selalu galau. Oke, okay. kan semuanya kameranya nanti dimasukkan ke Instagram. Eh, hey, Daud, you look very nice. Yes, sir. yang belum open kamera Aulia, Red, Lorena 
Can you open your camera? Dan Dwi, kalau enggak langsung aja enggak apa-apa ya. Cukup. Di, silahkan di capture saja langsung. Oke, okay, terima kasih Kayla dan terima kasih semuanya. Oh ya, yeah. we have uh, next month juga we have the same uh, uh, lecture series ya. Yeah. Uh, we actually have uh, uh, this uh, lecture series to invite uh, international caliber scientists like Dr. Nero to give to share and to uh, give uh, perspective to us ya. Yeah. Okay, make sure that next month ya yeah, you are. Uh, uh, You need to follow our Instagram ya, Biology Bio 4 ya. So we will post there kalau if we have a future uh, program ya. Oke, okay, uh, Dr. Nuro, again, many thanks. Dan semuanya, Prof. Ratu juga ya. Saya tutup acara hari ini dengan Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye-bye semuanya.